Welcome to A Year of War and Peace. I'm your host, Brian E. Denton. A Year of War and Peace is a daily, year-long, chapter-by-chapter reading of and meditation on Leo Tolstoy's epic novel, War and Peace. In these videos and podcasts, you'll be treated to a free reading of one chapter per day of the novel, plus a reflective essay I've written individually tailored to that day's chapter. These readings are offered for free, though if you'd like to support me, you can do so in one of three ways. First, you could purchase my ebook, A Year of War and Peace. It features the entire novel, plus all of my reflective essays, and it's only $2.99 on Amazon.com. You could also become a patron at patreon.com slash Brian E. Denton. If you sign up there, you'll receive a sonnet once a month, plus a link to an ebook of my collected sonnets. Finally, if you like, you can make a one-time donation to my PayPal account. The email there is brianedenton at gmail.com. You can also use that email to contact me. I'd be happy to hear from you. Your support is greatly appreciated. Today's reading and reflection is from chapter 286. Chapter 286. Early in the morning on the 6th of October, Pierre went out of the shed, and on returning, stopped by the door to play with a little blue-gray dog, with a long body and short bandy legs that jumped about him. This little dog lived in their shed, sleeping beside Karatiev at night. It sometimes made excursions into the town, but always returned again. Probably it had never had an owner, and it still belonged to nobody and had no name. The French called it Azor. The soldier who told stories called it Fimgalka. Karatiev and others called it Grey or sometimes Flabby. Its lack of a master, a name, or even of a breed or any definite color did not seem to trouble the blue-gray dog in the least. Its furry tail stood up firm and round as a plume. Its bandy legs served it so well that it would often gracefully lift a hind leg and run very easily and quickly on three legs, as if disdaining to use all four. Everything pleased it. Now it would roll on its back, yelping with delight. Now bask in the sun with a thoughtful air of importance, and now frolic about playfully with a chip of wood or straw. Pierre's attire by now consisted of a dirty torn shirt, the only remnant of his former clothing, a pair of soldier's trousers, which by Karatiev's advice he tied with string around the ankles for warmth, and a peasant coat and cap. Physically, he had changed much during this time. He no longer seemed stout, though he still had the appearance of solidity and strength hereditary to his family. A beard and mustache covered the lower part of his face, and a tangle of hair, infested with lice, curled round his head like a cap. The look of his eyes was resolute, calm, and animatedly alert as never before. The former slackness which had shown itself, even in his eyes, was now replaced by an energetic readiness for action and resistance. His feet were bare. Pierre first looked down the field across which vehicles and horsemen were passing that morning, then into the distance across the river, then at the dog who was pretending to be in earnest about biting him, and then at his bare feet, which he placed with pleasure in various positions, moving his dirty, thick, big toes. Every time he looked at his bare feet, a smile of animated self-satisfaction flitted across his face. The sight of them reminded him of all he had experienced and learned during these weeks, and this recollection was pleasant to him. For some days the weather had been calm and clear with slight frost in the mornings, which is called an old wives' summer. In the sunshine the air was warm, and that warmth was particularly pleasant with the invigorating freshness of the morning frost still in the air. On everything, far and near, lay the magic crystal glitter seen only at that time of autumn. The sparrow hills were visible in the distance, with the village, the church, and the large white house. The bare trees, the sand, the bricks and roofs of the houses, the green church spire, and the corners of the white house in the distance, all stood out in the transparent air in the most delicate outline and with unnatural clearness. Nearby could be seen the familiar ruins of a half-burned mansion occupied by the French, with lilac bushes still showing dark green beside the fence. And even that ruined, befouled house, which in dull weather was repulsively ugly, seemed quietly beautiful now, in the clear, motionless brilliance. A French corporal, with coat unbuttoned in a homely way, 
a skull cap on his head and a short pipe in his mouth, came from behind a corner of the shed and approached Pierre with a friendly wink. What sunshine, Monsieur Cuire? Their name for Pierre. Eh? Just like spring. And the corporal leaned against the door and offered Pierre his pipe, though whenever he offered it, Pierre always declined it. To be on the march in such weather, he began. Pierre inquired what was being said about leaving, and the corporal told him that nearly all the troops were starting, and there ought to be an order about the prisoners that day. Sokolov, one of the soldiers in the shed with Pierre, was dying, and Pierre told the corporal that something should be done about him. The corporal replied that Pierre need not worry about that, as they had an ambulance and a permanent hospital, and derangements would be made for the sick, and that in general, everything that could happen had been foreseen by the authorities. Besides, monsieur, you have only to say a word to the captain, you know. He is a man who never forgets anything. Speak to the captain when he makes his round. He will do anything for you. The captain of whom the corporal spoke often had long chats with Pierre and showed him all sorts of favors. You see, St. Thomas, he said to me the other day, Monsieur Curiel is a man of education who speaks French. He is a Russian signor who has had misfortunes, but he is a man. He knows what's what. If he wants anything and asks me, he won't get a refusal. When one has studied, you see, one likes education and well-bred people. It's not for your sake I mention this, monsieur. The other day, if it had not been for you, that affair would have ended ill. And after chatting a while longer, the corporal went away. The affair he had alluded to had happened a few days before, a fight between the prisoners and the French soldiers in which Pierre had succeeded in pacifying his comrades. Some of the prisoners who had heard Pierre talking to the corporal immediately asked what the Frenchman had said. While Pierre was repeating what he had been told about the army leaving Moscow, a thin, sallow, tattered French soldier came up to the door of the shed. Rapidly and timidly raising his fingers to his forehead by way of greeting, he asked Pierre whether a soldier to whom he had given a shirt to sew was in the shed. A week before the French had had boot leather and linen issued to them, which they had given out to the prisoners to make up boots and shirts for them. Ready, ready, dear fellow, said Karatiev, coming out with a neatly folded shirt. Karatiev, on account of the warm weather and for convenience at work, was wearing only trousers and a tattered shirt as black as soot. His hair was bound round, workman fashion, with a wisp of lime tree bast, and his round face seemed rounder and pleasanter than ever. A promise is own brother to performance. I said Friday, and here it is, ready, said Platon, smiling and unfolding the shirt he had sewn. The Frenchman glanced around uneasily, and then, as if overcoming his hesitation, rapidly threw off his uniform and put on the shirt. He had a long, greasy, flowered silk waistcoat next to his sallow, thin, bare body, but no shirt. He was evidently afraid the prisoners looking on would laugh at him and thrust his head into the shirt hurriedly. None of the prisoners said a word. See, it fits well, Platon kept repeating, pulling the shirt straight. The Frenchman, having pushed his head and hands through without raising his eyes, looked down at the shirt and examined the seams. You see, dear man, this is not a sewing shop, and I had no proper tools, and, as they say, one needs a tool even to kill a louse, said Platon with one of his round smiles, obviously pleased with his work. It's good, quite good, thank you, said the Frenchman in French, but there must be some linen left over. It will fit better still when it sets on your body, said Karatiev, still admiring his handiwork. You'll be nice and comfortable. Well, thanks, thanks, old fellow, but the bit's left over, said the Frenchman again, and smiled. He took out an assignation ruble note and gave it to Karatiev, but give me the pieces that are over. Pierre saw that Platon did not want to understand what the Frenchman was saying, and he looked on without interfering. Karatiev thanked the Frenchman for the money and went on admiring his own work. The Frenchman insisted on having the pieces returned that were left over and asked Pierre to translate what he said. "'What does he want the bits for?' said Karatiev. "'They'd make fine leg bands for us. Well, never mind.' And Karatiev, with a suddenly changed and saddened expression, took a small bundle of scraps from the inside of his shirt and gave it to the Frenchman without looking at him. Oh, dear, muttered Karatiev and went away. 
The Frenchman looked at the linen, considered for a moment, then looked inquiringly at Pierre, and, as if Pierre's look had told him something, suddenly blushed and shouted in a squeaky voice, Platon! Eh, hey, Platon! Keep them for yourself! And handing back the odd bits, he turned and went out. There, look at that, said Karatsev, swaying his head. People said they were not Christians, but they too have souls. It's what the old folk used to say. A sweating hand's an open hand, a dry hand's close. He's naked, but yet he's given it back. Karatsev smiled thoughtfully and was silent a while, looking at the pieces. But they'll make grand leg bands, dear friend, he said, and went back into the shed. All right, that's my reading of chapter 286. I will now proceed to my reflection on the same. A Year of War and Peace, Day 286, New Yorkers. In the mid-Atlantic region of North America, nestled into the Hudson Raritan Estatuary, there exists a commercial trading people known as New Yorkers. This polyglot, multi-ethnic assemblage of individuals cooperate by means of manufacturers, services, creative industries, real estate, insurance, healthcare, and financial markets to produce a gross municipal product in excess of $1.3 trillion per annum. By world historical standards, the New Yorkers are among the wealthiest people to have ever lived. Despite such riches, however, New Yorkers suffer $14 billion worth of productivity losses per year due to mental health issues. In addition, the mental health counselor's employment market is one of the thickest in the nation. Clearly, New Yorkers are in need of a little help. Perhaps a share of those in need, those with the mildest cases of worry or depression, for instance, would do well to look at Pierre Bazukov in today's chapter. Pierre Bazukov is also a rich man with his share of problems. These problems, well documented here at A Year of War and Peace, precede his capture and imprisonment by the French. But it's during his capture and imprisonment by the French where Pierre finally learns how to live in an imperfect world. We see a bit of this development today. Fortune has traded in Pierre's palatial estates and aristocratic soirees for a simple shed in the company of common prisoners of war. He is dressed in dirty old rags. His hair is crawling with lice. His food probably is too. Yet, we sense a certain serenity in him today. We've not seen him quite like this before. Every time he looked at his bare feet, a smile of animated self-satisfaction flitted across his face, Tolstoy writes of Pierre. The sight of them reminded him of all he had experienced and learned during these weeks, and this recollection was pleasant to him. Pierre no doubt learned his lessons at the bare feet of Platon Karatiev, a Russian peasant whose poverty stands in stark contrast to Pierre's own privilege. Platon's good cheer proves that not wealth, but something else provides sustained happiness in the life of men. Perhaps, if we pasted Platon's visage on a Times Square advertisement, it could serve as a reminder to those peevish New Yorkers that they should all chill out a little bit sometimes even if the MTA is a fucking nightmare, and I swear to God, I'm never going to stop screaming if the R train is delayed again. Daily Meditation The notion of testing the steadfastness of your soul is so engaging that I shall give you a prescription from the precepts of our great teachers. Set aside a number of days during which you will be content with plain and scanty food and with coarse and crude dress, and say to yourself, Is that what frightened me? Seneca, Letter on Holidays. All right, so that concludes my reading of and reflection on chapter 286 of War and Peace. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks so much for joining me. Remember that if you'd like to support me, you can do so either by purchasing the ebook, A Year of War and Peace, becoming a patron at patreon.com, or making a one time donation to PayPal. The links to all that are down below in the show notes in the description. Also, down there, you're going to find links to my Amazon wish list for books and DVDs. If you get me a book or a DVD, or a book and a DVD, we'll set up a Zoom talk so we can talk about that book or DVD. So uh, thanks in advance for that. If that's what you choose to do, your support is greatly appreciated. Tomorrow we're going to be reading and reflecting on chapter 287. I hope you'll join me. Until then, take care of yourselves and others.